Uh, hello, good morning, everybody. Um, and welcome to our panel on what is geospatial data archiving and why is it important for Minnesota. Uh, so we want to learn a little bit more about uh, who's here and what you all think of archiving. So we have a short poll that we're going to put up uh, for a few minutes here. Um, just a couple of quick questions for you all to fill out. Um, and then we're going to have time at the end of this hour for questions. Uh, so uh, if you wanna ask questions in the Q&A or the chat, uh, we'll try to take a look at them uh, along the way, but we'll most likely uh, be able to answer those uh, towards the end of this hour. Um, so here is all of the panelists that we have today. Um, so I'm Karen Majewitz, and I'm going to be moderating the panel. Uh, we have five experts uh, in the fields of GIS, data management, metadata, and digital archiving. Uh, but first, I want to provide a little bit of context for how this group got together. Uh, so I work at the University of Minnesota's Borchert Map Library, which has been collecting and saving paper maps issued by government agencies for decades. Uh, however, our collection policy does not cover born digital data. Uh, as a result, the public geospatial information from the more recent past is not part of our collection, nor is it being systematically saved elsewhere. So I often find myself wondering how will researchers in the future study the spatial environment of our time if we're not collecting and saving GIS data today. Beginning in 2018, staff from the Borchert Library have been working to remedy this challenge with the Minnesota Geospatial Advisory Council by leading an archiving work group that includes members from both the library and the GIS communities. A large part of our activities so far has been to share knowledge between these two communities and to educate each other about the importance of archiving, as well as the complexities of spatial data. Uh, to learn more about this work group specifically, please check out our conference poster and our lightning talk this Friday. So along the way of this work, we realized that Wisconsin was actually much further along with this than with Minnesota. Uh, if you go to our respective centralized clearinghouses, you can find statewide data for foundational spatial layers like parcels, roads, addresses for every county in Wisconsin for every year starting uh, at least in 2015. Uh, by contrast, these kinds of layers are only available in Minnesota for the Metro GIS area. Uh, so we've begun looking to our Eastern neighbors for insight on how they achieved this goal. Um, so here's the outline of today's panel. Uh, Sarah and Carol will be describing the basics of digital archiving. Uh, Zeb and Nancy will give an overview of Minnesota's current geodata environment. And to help us think about different ways of approaching these challenges, we have Jamie here from Wisconsin, who was instrumental in that Wisconsin story. And at the end, we'll have time for some discussion questions. Oh, hey, Carol, you're muted. I hit the video button. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that, everybody. All right, uh, thanks, Karen and Sarah. Um, Sarah and I are going to give a brief introduction on digital archiving and digital preservation. So my name is Carol Kussman, and I am the Digital Preservation Analyst at the University of Minnesota Libraries. And I work on helping to preserve the digital records of the libraries um, that is required that need long term preservation, as well as materials from units within the archives and special collections departments and materials from the Minnesota Digital Library. And I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to talk about the first few slides and then I'll jump back in. 
Awesome. Thanks, Carol. Uh, so my name is Sarah Barsness. I work at the Minnesota Historical Society, uh, where I work primarily with born digital or digitally acquired materials. Um, and I work across all of our collecting areas, um, private donors, government records, sound and visual, any format type uh, that our curators want to collect. I try to help them in that uh, mission. So to kind of frame our discussion today, I wanted to start really, really basic um, and, and sort of big picture and talk about what an archive is and what it does. Um, and the goal of any archive is to preserve and provide long-term access to the material it manages. Um, and the backbone of providing this long-term access is preservation. Without preservation, there is no access. Without access, there's no point in preserving. So these things are sort of dualities uh, of each other that are embodied in any archive. And in a digital archive, it gets uh, really interesting um, because digital materials are gonna require digital preservation. Um, so let's define what we mean by digital collection. So next slide, Karen. So when we talk about collections, you know, what are we actually talking about? What are we preserving? And what we're preserving is content with enduring value. Um, and we mean value to the people who made the record, but also sometimes to other people. Um, a letter that somebody wrote during the Civil War was meant to communicate, say, with family back home, but to researchers today, it's a, an invaluable record of what happened in a certain place and time. So uh, preserving this content with enduring value in the digital realm gets extra complicated because there's the content itself, right? But that content comes in a digital container, one or more files that are used to help a human make sense of that content or a computer sometimes. Those digital files are stored on a physical media, a CD, a thumb drive, a server, wherever it's stored, it's on a physical container and that physical container also needs to be cared for. And sometimes you also need specific software and hardware to render those files on that physical container to access the content. So you see how this kind of cascades, it gets really big, really fast. Um, but that's where digital archiving comes in. The other key component about what we're preserving in a GIS archive is that these are records of government activity. Um, and there are records laws and records retention schedules that apply to this information. Um, and one of the big things to know about state record laws and government retention schedules is that if you work in any level of government, you should have a records retention schedule. And it's almost always organized by content, not by format. So for example, it doesn't say, do A with letters and B with emails. No, it just says do this with all correspondence. And the same is true for GIS, right? Uh, so this is an example from Washington County. Uh, it's a road plat book from 1857, this particular page is. Um, and according to the general retention schedule for counties, this should be kept permanently. It is a permanent record but nobody makes road plat books anymore, right? It's center line layers, road center line layers in a GIS. It's the same content. So that new content, that layer in a GIS also needs to be retained permanently. Permanent's a very long time when we start talking in the digital realm. So let's talk about how we do that preserving now. So next slide, Karen. So when we talk about forever, we have to be proactive in our preservation. So digital preservation is a series of managed actions that aims to maintain trustworthiness and accessibility of digital objects over time. So again, it's proactive, it's planned, it's carefully documented. We need to know what was done and when so that we can maybe undo it if we have to, or we know what information might've been lost or added during a format migration. 
Um, and this includes activities that are both done directly to the collections themselves, but also administrative activities like policies, procedures, manuals, that kind of stuff. Um, so one example of a direct activity is fixity checking. Um, that means going through every one and zero in a file or a set of files and making sure that none of them have changed over time. Great way to make sure your information is still good. Um, but an administrative activity might be updating your policy or your procedure on how you create and manage your backups uh, when you have a new backup technology. Say you switch from one tape format to another tape format or you start using a vendor. Um, so Carol's going to do a little bit more of a deep dive with you now, uh, walking you through sort of the whole process from beginning to end of how we preserve a digital item. So take it away, Carol. All right, next slide, please, Karen. Okay, like Sarah said, I'm going to start kind of walking through um, processes that we do. So the first thing that we do in digital preservation is appraisal. And so appraisal and digital preservation is the point at which you decide if something is worthwhile to keep. Um, <clears throat> like with analog materials or paper materials, deciding that you want to keep an object, a digital object, is a long-term commitment of time and resources. And so there's some questions that we ask when appraising digital materials. Um, and this appraisal is done more on those records that are not held under a retention schedule. If it's held under a retention schedule, we need to find a way to keep it, especially those things of permanent importance. <clears throat> but some of the questions that we ask are, does the content have value? Is it worthwhile to keep? And you need to ask this question in the context of all of the other questions we think about, <clears throat> because if you have an ops files on an obsolete form, format in an obsolete format on old media, the content on it has got to be pretty important in order to be able to justify the time and effort to get those materials off of those off of those formats, file formats. I can't talk today. <laughs> get them off of those materials in the first place. <clears throat> Another question we ask is, is the file format one that you can work with and can you preserve it over the long term? So how much work are you going to need to have to do to make or keep that file useful and provide access to it over time? So we look for common, um, common formats, stable formats, and ones that are publicly documented. <clears throat> and is the media that the materials are on, is it usable? Um, if the materials came in on a five and a quarter floppy drive or floppy disk, do you have a five and a quarter floppy drive in order to access that material? If not, how much is it going to cost to get one and make it work? Um, and is the content on there going to justify that work involved or that effort? Does the value of the content outweigh the preservation costs? So if you assume that you're intending to maintain the materials forever, which like Sarah said is a long time, you're going to need storage space, backups, you're gonna to have to have um, people to be able to provide labor to preserve those materials. And is the content itself worth that cost? Another thing we think about is, is there useful metadata already provided or associated with the materials? And are the materials well organized? Or how much work are we going to need to have to do to make these files usable or accessible? <clears throat> And are there any access restrictions or copyright issues associated with these materials? Is there sensitive or private data in there that we need to take care of? And how difficult is it going to be to take care of those things? And we also want to think about access. You know, how can we provide access? And what do researchers need in order to access those files? And for GIS records, we already know the answers to many of these questions. However, asking these questions is part of the process. Next slide, please. So one of the other things that we consider when appraising records is the concept of versions or version control. <clears throat> and in some cases, we would only want to keep the final copy or the final version. Uh, but there's other times that we're going to want to keep versions of those files as they change over time. So when I'm reviewing records for a grant project and all of the records come in, the final version of the grant report is important to me. It's the final output of the grant. 
Um, that report probably went through multiple versions and edits before it got to the final version, but I don't need to keep any of those drafts. Um, I just want that final outcome, that final report. And so in appraising those records, I'm gonna keep the final report, I'm going to get rid of any drafts, and I'm gonna keep additional working files that were important to the project or the group. But if I'm reviewing papers from an author, the final copy text of a book is important, but the drafts may also be important for people to learn from and to figure out kind of what their writing process was. So researchers are going to be interested in that. So I would keep the final version as well as the drafts. And the same is true for GIS data. GIS data sets are updated all of the time and is definitely important for users to have that most up-to-date information, but it's also valuable to have past versions of a data set. You know, for people who are working in construction, it's important to know what is around them now, but it's also, they need to know what was in the area in the past. You would need to know before you started construction if there's any obstructions or dangerous elements that you may encounter. For example, is there an underground storage tank that used to be here? Um, so, and that may not be on the most recent layer of a data set. And there's a lot of other reasons for um, preserving versions of GIS data sets, um, water quality, water locations, things like that. Um, things we wanna think about is how often are those data sets um, updated and what is an appropriate you know, time to capture those, to be able to archive those data sets. Next slide, please. So after the decision has been made to keep something long-term, the materials are processed and described. And this means doing everything that you need to do to be able to make the materials ready for use and easy to find. So processing, we do things like completing a virus check. We review files in more detail to see if something else can be weeded. Do we really need everything that came in with the collection? <clears throat> we review things for sensitive information. We don't want to be storing credit card information or social security numbers, that kind of things. So if we do find anything like that, we would redact it. And we also may reorganize a collection, creating folders, renaming folders or files, helping to make things easier to understand. <clears throat> we then need to describe the files so people can find them, know what they are and know how to use them. So as a whole, some of the things that we care about are more internal and they're going to help us preserve the files over time. Um, some things like file types, we wanna know what file the file formats are, we wanna know how many files we have, the total size that they take up, we want, to under, we want to know the checksum values. We want to know collection details and where these materials are stored over time. But then that descriptive metadata can be used for discovery and use. Um, and it doesn't have to be anything grandiose or um, anything like that, but GIS data has a metadata standard that is very helpful. Next slide. <clears throat> So the perception is that digital objects are free, easy to store, and permanent. And the reality is vastly different. So to assist with long-term preservation, we need to be able to manage the files over time. It's not just sticking it on a shelf, um, sticking it in a storage location, and forgetting about it. Um, digital objects require constant care and attention. Um, unlike paper, right, things in paper maps we could stick it in a box, stick it on a shelf, tuck it away for years and years without somebody even looking at them. But digital objects require constant attention. <clears throat> and that's what we call kind of our management activities. So some of these activities would include um, creating, recording, and preserving metadata. Um, we would monitor those objects for corruptions, trying to figure out if we lost some of those ones and zeros. Are the files degrading? Um, and we would do this checking at a regular interval. We may need to migrate or refresh files from one file format to another or from one storage medium to another. And we would do this as necessary. And then to kind of address those issues as a whole over time, we develop preservation plans to <clears throat> be able to care for objects 
and have this ongoing documentation plan. And all of these activities together lead to the process of continuously ingesting, storing, and providing access to our files. Next slide, please. Metadata is key to understanding what we have, what's been done to an object, what needs to be done, and where it is located. And there are many different types of metadata, some of which you may have heard about, others you use without even knowing it. To manage long term, to manage data long term, <clears throat> I need metadata that's going to help me do that. And I like to define preservation metadata as anything that assists with the long term preservation of a digital file that helps to ensure its authenticity and accessibility to those records over time. And this metadata includes what can be categorized as administrative metadata, technical metadata, and structural metadata. And it includes information about file formats, how files are related to each other, the custodial history and provenance of the files, and rights information. And descriptive metadata, it is what it is what is used to describe digital content and what is used by researchers to find the materials that they are looking for. Um, and this metadata is often provided by the content creator because they're the ones who know about the content of the files. Um, and Nancy's gonna talk more about how GIS metadata is used to describe data sets in Minnesota. And so what I just gave you, what Sarah and I just talked about is a very quick high level overview of digital preservation activities. Um, and we're happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentation. Um, about this, and Zeb is now going to talk to you about the Minnesota Geospatial Commons. Thank you, Carol, and um, <clears throat> I'm just going to give you guys a brief uh, overview of how the uh, Minnesota Geospatial Commons, kind of the background of how it went, came together and how it fits into archiving, and I think this will also provide an interesting contrast with the way Wisconsin went about it. So uh, next slide, well, I, and uh, <laughs> I'm the GIS Data Systems Coordinator for uh, Department of Natural Resources. Um, so um, that's how I got involved in the Commons and in the archiving group because we have a lot of data um, and we needed a way to share it. And that's how we started with the Commons. And now <clears throat> um, as that's uh, matured and, and starting to uh, have some older data sets that are no longer available, we're more urgently recognizing the need for archiving. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the commons here. So the Minnesota Geospatial Commons came together, um, growing on close to a decade now, um, as a replacement for several kind of independent uh, data uh, portals, GIS data portals. Um, <clears throat> in, our, in the DNR's case, the DNR data belly was especially um, important piece uh, for us of distributing common uh, data that now on the commons. And so this, this uh, allowed us to put a lot of time into the commons project uh, because it was saving us a bunch of resources and time. So that's, um, that's why I've been on this project for many years. And we <clears throat> basically collaborated with a bunch of different agencies uh, in state government and, and informally <clears throat> uh, beyond uh, to make sure that this would be uh, a way for publishers, both state and local government, as well as universities and nonprofits to be able to share their content uh, in, a, in a kind of <clears throat> plug and play way as much as possible so that um, it would be much more centralized location for people to find their data. And so um, that was the framework we came into this. And that means archiving was completely out of scope uh, for the Commons project. It was all about kind of replacing these data portals and making our data available to the public so we didn't get a bunch of emails, right? Something like that, and call, phone calls back in the day, right? So um, next slide, please. So the thankfully, the background for this, uh, the backbone of this uh, commons uh, infrastructure uh, is very conducive to archiving. So I'm just getting a little detail about that. Um, so the, the Geospatial Data Resource Site, the GDRS, is the data structure that supports the commons. Um, and the, uh, the way it was designed, uh, having it self-contained so that each 
GDRS is independent from another one. It's modular, so each resource within a GDRS um, can, can operate independently or a subset of the resources can be used. And it's file-based, so it's very simple to just copy in its entirety uh, or part of it. Um, and so for that reason, it's pretty easy to kind of informally archive uh, without a lot of planning. Um, and <clears throat> uh, just a little bit of background about what we're storing in here. So in, in addition to GIS data, we also have applications and then um, what we refer to as a system meta, metadata or uh, what Carol early, early referred to as internal metadata. So that's the metadata that helps uh, keep your systems operational and helps it plug in with the commons and um, that sort of thing. So we've got uh, GDRS sites at a number of state organizations um, that uh, are synced on a nightly basis. Um, and then the DNR also independently uh, operates uh, a bunch of offices uh, because we have a very distributed workforce. And so we actually have hundreds of sites across uh, the state. And so what this means is that there's lots of backup. If there's lots of redundancy, um, so for those of you filling out the poll, if you're from the DNR, yes, we do have lots of backup built into the system, um, but there's no scheduled archiving on a regular basis. So if you want to plug in, uh, say, I want data from X number of years or months ago, um, that's not built into the GDRS by nature, but it's easy to do. So that's what I'm going to talk about is we recognized this need a few years ago. So if we move on to the next slide, um, I'll, I'll show you what we decided to kind of tackle uh, in terms of DNRs, <clears throat> what I'm calling our dark archive, um, as in uh, it's not easily accessible uh, unless you already know about it. So the reason uh, this began is I got a lot of uh, regular requests for older data um, and some to the point where it was important enough that we set up individual customized archiving schedules for certain resources. And Rather than realize too late, I would wished I'd, I'd thought of something else that we might need to archive, I figured I would just archive everything that we had on our GDRS because like I said, it's fairly simple to do. You just copy uh, files to a new location. You just need some disk space on the server somewhere. So um, in order to maximize the utility and um, size util utilization of this, I only kept what change year to year. So um, beginning in January 2018, I copied the full GDRS. And then the next year, um, anything that was unchanged moved to the current year. Anything that was deleted or changed was kept in the previous year. And so this cuts down the size a lot, but still gives us uh, an easy way to look back in time, but just on an annual basis, just kind of a bare bones stopgap. So at least we have some way of going back in time or something particularly traumatic happens with our data or, uh, or if you uh, really need to <clears throat> see what happened a year ago. Um, and because the commons uh, stores both uh, the, the data or application and its associated uh, descriptive metadata, uh, we have the whole package available um, with the context needed to use it. Um, but it's a dark archive in that there's no built-in distribution mechanism, unlike the GDRS and the commons, and it's only available by request. I don't have it set up even internally in a way that's easily accessed, uh, just because it was more done in an ad hoc fashion without a, a kind of plan. And that's why um, I've been participating on this uh, archiving work group. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, metadata is a really important part of making this uh, data useful. And so that's what uh, Nancy's going to dig into a little bit more now. Great. Well, thank you, Zeb. Um, yeah, I'm Nancy Rader. I'm a GIS data specialist at the Minnesota Geospatial Information Office. And I help people find uh, geospatial data that they need. I lead the Commons Operations Group, of which Zeb is a member. and also on the archiving work group outreach um, subcommittee. So yeah, you know, if I'm going to talk about descriptive metadata and the commons, and next slide, please. If you've already used the commons, you know that for every data resource, 
there's a place that says full metadata record. You can click on the view button and you can see quite a lot of information about the data that's presented to you in a very standardized way. And the next slide, please. And that's because uh, we, we expect publishers, um, we say it's, it's not enough to just click a share button and, and put some data out there without telling people what it is. We expect them to provide at least enough information so that anybody using the commons can decide whether or not the resource is going to meet their needs. And this is answering the common questions that any of you would have if somebody just handed you some sort of a data set. You'd want to know who is giving me this data set? Is that an authoritative source or not? Um, what, what is it? What, what is the topic area? What area of geography does it cover? Is it going to be including my area of interest? When was it collected? Is it something the most current? Or am I looking for something historic and I want to go back in time and know when that was collected? Knowing why it was collected can be very helpful in order to figure out, like maybe it was collected for general purposes and I need something very specific and it won't meet my needs and how, what sort of sources were used and what sort of processes um, were gone through to develop this data so that I really understand what I have a lot better. And we also expect uh, publishers to provide their contact information because it's almost impossible to anticipate every single question that people might have. And so this way users can ask if they have still have questions and then um, the publisher can realize, oh, I forgot to, to say that and add that to the metadata. Uh, they can fix broken links or, or whatever. So it, it helps keep the metadata complete and maintained. Next slide, Karen. So uh, where does all this information come from? Uh, there is no GIS software button that says, click and create that metadata, fill in those blanks. And that's, um, there's no automatic way or magic because the GIS software doesn't know the answers. Uh, it's people who do. And so that's why requiring metadata on the commons encourages creating it when the answers are fresh in mind. The people who did the work are still there. They haven't retired. Uh, they haven't gone on to other projects and forgotten what they did. So the good news is that that positions us well uh, for archiving. Uh, as Carol said during that appraisal section, you know, is useful metadata already provided? And so we hope that for all those resources on the commons, once they get to the point of being eligible to be or considered for archiving, that their descriptive metadata is already there and is uh, complete and current. So no one will need to just be sorting through old reports and emails trying to figure out what in the heck is on these. Uh, these floppy disks. Um, the future users will be able to understand the data even after their creators have long since moved on. And it prevents that valuable work from being thrown away. Next slide, please. So the metadata looks and appears in a standard form because we do follow a standard. And the URL there at the top, you can find out more information about anything here on the slide. We use the Minnesota Geographic Metadata Guidelines, which is consistent and just a simpler version of a national metadata standard. It uses standard tags. Um, there, a simple example is anything in the title is bracketed by a beginning and ending tag so that any script anywhere in the commons, uh, any other site or an archive will know to find the title between those tags. And there's free customized software that you can download uh, to input the metadata. Our help page has links to find out more about these guidelines, the software, creating metadata specifically for the commons and for some of the specific fields. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll just end with saying that we do have uh, plans for uh, the coming year and uh, the the Minnesota Geospatial Advisory Council would uh, really like to adopt an official metadata standard for the community. 
Uh, the existing guidelines were adopted in 1998, which is, I guess, a little ways ago, but um, it's held up pretty well. Uh, the information we need is, is, you know, all that who, what, where, why, you know, has remained pretty constant. But maybe there's some fields that we don't really use anymore. Uh, maybe there's some things we've missed. Maybe things could be better explained. So the Council Standards Committee will be organizing um, a public review of the guidelines. So look for an announcement next year about that. And that would uh, be logical to revisit our help materials and tools. And your input is welcome at any time. You don't need to wait for the public review. We've got the uh, our email address there and we'll put the email and the um, URL to the other page in the chat. So thank you and I'll turn it back to Karen to introduce the next section. Thank you, everybody. I hope that uh, gives us a bit of an overview of what we're doing here in Minnesota. Um, so we're uh, very lucky today to be joined all the way from uh, Madison, Wisconsin, by our next speaker, Jamie Martindale. Uh, and I'll let you take it away to tell us about. Great. Thanks, Karen. Um, just sharing my slides here. Hopefully that looks OK. Um, I just really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this panel today and to talk with all of you a little bit uh, more about our experience with archiving geospatial data in Wisconsin. So just by way of introduction, my name is Jamie Martindale and I'm the Map and Geospatial Data Librarian in the Robinson Map Library, which is part of the Geography Department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison started at the library in 2003, and since that time have collaborated on a lot of projects and initiatives with the Wisconsin State Cartographer's Office, um, who conveniently enough is also part of the geography department at UW-Madison, and in more recent years have collaborated more frequently with uh, the Wisconsin Land Information Program, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But through uh, this 15-minute uh, uh, presentation, I want to illustrate a timeline and describe some of the process involved in data, our data archiving, how the methods uh, of access to the content have changed over time, and some future directions in terms of long-term preservation planning for uh, that content. So in the early days, um, this is going back to 2005, 2006, we were really focused on supporting the educational needs of our users on the UW-Madison campus in terms of geospatial data. So our archiving really started out of necessity. It was prompted by requests we were getting by students and researchers for this information. So early on, the focus was on county data. That was really the scale and resolution of information that, that users were requesting most frequently. And we found that that resulted in variable acquisition scenarios across the state. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, it's important to note that at this time, the data was, um, every, every data set that was brought into the library was under the umbrella of educational use um, by our students and uh, faculty uh, and staff at, at the university. And it was also at this time that we started thinking about the metadata and documentation process so that we could educate users on uh, what the data was and what they were getting from the library. I did a presentation uh, early on in 2006 at a Wisconsin Land Information Association regional meeting, um, kind of outlining an experience that I had working with a researcher at UWC grant um, to collect tax parcel and assessment data for the 15 coastal counties in Wisconsin. And so the goal was to work with uh, this researcher to obtain this data and sort of document this entire process along the way and, and figure out what this process might look like for a more formal archiving uh, program through the library. And this was a time when counties in Wisconsin often had uh, land, um, data distribution agreements or even more formal licensing agreements or fees associated with the data. And so even just in these 15 counties, we ran across different kinds of experiences in terms of how the data would be acquired. Um, so it was pretty variable across just this landscape of, of 15 counties. So um, this slide basically just illustrates a shift in how we changed our process for adding um, data to the library archive. So from 2006 through 2011, we only added data when individual researchers requested it um, for projects. 
And we found that by 2011, we were handling so many requests in a given year that it was hard to deal with that lag time of going out and making the request and waiting for a response and then acquiring the data and getting it into the hands of users in time for the work that they needed to do. So in 2012, we decided to do a comprehensive statewide request of a specific set of data layers to all 72 counties. And in terms of determining what those layers were going to be, we applied an appraisal process and looked at three primary cr criteria. So we looked back at our, our um, historic requests and looked at what was most frequently asked for uh, by users, because obviously it's important to collect things that are, are useful. Uh, we wanted to look at data layers that were most likely to be updated on a, a more frequent basis, making a single annual snapshot um, useful for them uh, over time. And then what were those foundational elements that we could collect most consistently across all 72 counties in Wisconsin? And then this list here is the list that we uh, came up with in 2012. Uh, the Wisconsin Land Information Program, if you're not familiar with it, um, started in the late 80s, um, and it's funded through uh, a real estate document recording fee that is applied to all real estate transactions in Wisconsin, and a portion of that fee is retained by counties for land records work. So every county has a land information office, um, and that, that retained fee goes to fund land records work and GIS work. The remainder of the fee goes into the Wisconsin Land Information Fund, which funds base budget grants to um, fund counties that, that retain less than $100,000 per year um, in the, the retained fees. So for those counties that have less people, less real estate transactions, um, the base budget grants kind of bring them up um, to a more equal level. So we see a huge change um, with Wisconsin Act 20, which was the biennial budget in Wisconsin um, from 2013 to 2015. And uh, Act 20 created a directive for the creation of a statewide digital parcel map. And so this marks the first time where WLIP would be going out and requesting tax parcel and assessment information from all 72 counties um, for the creation of an integrated publicly accessible statewide parcel layer. But of course, it's important to note that also at this time, the map library since 2012, also uh, requesting data layers uh, from counties, including parcels. So it made sense for us in 2015 with Act 20 to reevaluate what those selected layers were that we were asking for. Um, and you see these two lists sort of just illustrate the change um, in what we were collecting. So we, we went back and again and reevaluated requests and looked at um, what data layers were most useful um, by students and researchers, and just augmented this list with some of those things. Um, the parcels uh, we would be getting through the statewide parcel initiative. Um, and I, you'll notice I crossed off municipalities, and that's only because municipal boundaries are collected twice a year um, on a separate schedule by the Wisconsin Legislative Technology Service Bureau in coordination with the census. So we actually just archive the statewide municipal boundary layer from LTSB instead of going to all 72 counties and asking them for their, their municipal boundaries. Um, in 2014, again, in collaboration with the Wisconsin State Cartographer's Office, we wanted a way to more efficiently get this information, the data in the archive that was growing rapidly um, out to our users. And so we developed uh, an online geo portal. This is version one of Geodata at Wisconsin. Uh, and you'll notice that in that access column, we, we were able through this entire time to maintain that balance of providing access to public and restricted data. So for those counties that still required data sharing agreements or license agreements, we were still able to restrict access to that content by forcing users to log in with their university credentials. This timeline aims to illustrate um, two things. One, how access to the data changed over time. So from around 2006 to present, and how data, uh, how the collection grew over time. Um, so I mentioned we, we only added data up through 2011 based on individual requests. We then changed to that systematic statewide annual request, which overlapped for two years with WLIP. Um, and then in 2017, we, we decided to sort of join forces with WLIP to provide um, just one single request going out to counties 
um, for, for that data. Um, in terms of access, so we see a gradual shift in more open data as we work through, um, you know, from 20, from 2006 through 2014. And that just sort of naturally happened. We saw this, you know, gradual decrease in counties um, requiring things like agreements and things like that for their data. Um, in 2015, we surveyed all 72 counties to see if we could open up access to the entire data archive to all UW system institutions. Um, making that educational access, you know, go beyond just UW Madison, and we had all but two counties agree to that, so that allowed us to open it up a little bit further for educational use. Uh, and then in 2017, when WLIP started handling the annual request, um, data that came in through the WLIP request um, was all publicly accessible through um, the GeoPortal, through GeoData at Wisconsin. And this is just a snapshot of um, a page from uh, the submission documentation that counties see every year uh, that goes out uh, from WLIP with the annual request for data. Um, the parcels and the PLSS corners are integrated into uh, statewide layers. And um, you'll see in part D there, um, the list of all of the affectionately called the other, la other layers uh, that come directly to uh, the map library. And uh, we document those with descriptive metadata, oftentimes augmenting metadata that's uh, already there coming from um, the, off the county offices. Um, and this is just the list of those other layers that we process and then make available uh, through the geo portal and the Big Ten geo portal as well. Uh, just to echo what everyone else has said up to this point on the panel, that metadata is an essential piece of this process. We have a team of wonderful students uh, working in the library that document um, close to 800 data sets uh, per year that we add to the geo portal. Um, the, the largest portion of that coming from that WLIP call for data every year. Uh, we use ArcGIS Pro for um, all of our metadata authoring, editing, management. Um, and it works really well for descriptive metadata. And I would say that it even incorporates some administrative metadata elements as well in terms of how the data is structured, what the formats are, what the, the use and rights access um, and things like that. And in 2019, we uh, up, released an updated version of the GeoData at Wisconsin GeoPortal built on a more modern, updated software platform. Uh, makes it a little bit easier for, for us to group data into different collections and allow for different ways for users to browse the collection and search the collection. Um, but you'll see we, we've highlighted the, the Robinson Map Library data archive there listed as its own sort of separate collection, almost uh, 4,400 data sets in that collection today. And we, we tend to think of GeoData at Wisconsin as a system and not just an online tool. So it's much more to us than just that user interface that, that people interact with online. It's, it's a combination of all of these things really working together and the data archive and long-term preservation of the data in that archive are key parts uh, in that system. So I talk about full preservation and long-term preservation of our data archive as future work um, because it's been the missing piece that we have yet to, to fully realize yet in our process. Um, we've been in, in uh, contact with the UW Digital Collections Center, which is um, the, the center on campus that manages and, and maintains um, an internally developed repository and full preservation environment. So all of those things that um, Carol and Sarah talked about in terms of, of what preservation is in a preservation environment happens um, for us at the Digital Collections Center. So this is a, a repository environment where we can ingest unzipped versions of our vector data, um, starting with just our vector data, at least initially, um, with our descriptive metadata to be monitored over time for uh, file integrity. And um, it also is a dark archive. So this is not something that would be part of our system in terms of retrieval or incorporate into our workflow in any way other than um, an annual you know, stated preservation plan that includes ingesting specific data sets into it once a year um, when we add new data to, to the archive. And just uh, to wrap up some 
you know, lessons learned along the way. Um, better to save the data now than regret it later. I think this is probably the most important one. I mean, this is true even if you don't feel like you have a fully robust preservation environment to do this work within. I mean, we started with a file server and a list of directories. We started saving county data by year and it, it served us really well. Um, relationships with data providers is an ab absolutely essential piece to this work. Um, I made it a point early on in my time here to go to conferences, talk to people, talk about the library, talk to, to data providers about why the, the data that they're producing is useful to the academic community. Um, and regardless of status, so whether something is open or restricted, capturing a snapshot of it is really the ultimate goal. Um, if we had, you know, back in 2006, uh, put some requirement on that every data set we collected from counties in Wisconsin had to be open and publicly accessible, we wouldn't have been able to collect nearly as much valuable information as we had. Um, and it's true that things change over time, but if you don't capture it, um, you might not be able to fully realize that, you know, that fully public uh, access um, later. Um, and recognizing the value now, even if it doesn't seem significant or historic enough. So it's hard sometimes to think about like, okay, I have parcel data from two years ago, who cares, right? It doesn't seem like that's history. Um, but if we don't save it now, then we can't fully realize that true historic value that it has 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the line. So in the same way that we look at historic paper maps and our print collections, um, we have to save it now so that we can um, realize that historic value when it becomes really important to do so. And that is all I have. Karen, I will give the screen share back to you. All right, thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, I really appreciate hearing all of that. Um, so we do have a little bit of time left uh, and we'd love to hear questions from uh, those of you who uh, have been listening, uh, might be wondering about how you could archive your own data, might be wondering about what this all will entail. Um, I'll read something that uh, we saw in the chat. Uh, I don't know if everybody got a chance to see that uh, from Brett. Uh, he asks, if an organization is only sharing their Esri Open Data webpage to the Minnesota Geospatial Commons, do you believe they are missing out on any perks capabilities that could benefit them or their data users? Uh, and so what he's talking about is that in the commons, um, if a uh, county usually or a city has their own data portal hosted on the ArcGIS hub, um, then you uh, can find out about that portal by there'll be a listing in the commons that links out to it. Uh, that's as opposed to actually submitting data individually into the commons. Uh, and Zeb uh, answered a few questions in the chat. Zeb, did you want to say anything live as well about that? Sure, yeah, it's a, it a good question because um, if you've already gone to the work of setting up your own portal, um, it feels like a lot of duplicate work to put things in the commons. And um, that's why uh, the commons allows a variety of ways to participate um, because you can just put an app up there that's a link to another data portal. Um, and so, but it is important to understand what you're giving up uh, if you do that. And so um, if you already have a portal set up and you don't have the resources to set it up, that's fine. Um, but it, your individual resources won't show up in the comments. You won't be able to search them by um, data type or location or um, keyword or something like the category, <clears throat> some things like that, or even uh, publisher, um, you'll have to use uh, the link and they'll be kind of cordoned off in a separate uh, data portal, which is, which is fine if you know what, what your publisher is, right? But if uh, you're not, if you're just looking for a certain category of information, but you don't know who the publisher is, that data will be a little harder to find for some people. Um, and the other thing we were just talking about here and later on in the chat is, um, <clears throat> the benefits uh, of standardization and in, in ensuring that you have a, a product that has the right metadata and kind of looks consistent along with the rest of the data in the commons, right? So we put in a few extra checks, makes it a little bit harder to get stuff in there than just dumping it on there, like, like uh, you guys were all saying about uh, making sure we have an, uh, an, a quality product and get it out there. 
But that means that all the resources have uh, follow certain uh, naming conventions and, and have certain fields that pop into the right places. So it's a lot easier to kind of digest all this data. We've got almost a thousand resources on there. So it needs to be organized enough that you can find what you want to find and evaluate it and to see uh, whether it's useful. Because just having a data resource up there, uh, knowing where it's from is important, uh, but knowing more than that is usually necessary to actually use the data and know how to use it. So that those would be the, the considerations. Uh, if, you, if you're concerned about not being in the commons, that would be what I would most be thinking about. Now I was gonna um, throw in as well, that if you're using a hosted portal to provide access to your data, my guess is that data is sitting on a cloud-based server somewhere. Um, and so you are sort of losing a certain amount of control over that data, you're relying on your vendor, your cloud vendor to do appropriate storage. Um, and whenever I am using a vendor supplied product or storage, I always like to think about sort of a worst case scenario, right? What if their server farm blows up? What if they go under? Uh, what am I going to do? How am I going to continue to provide access to these things? Um, so using sort of a, a both and version, having a version in Esri in your hub and having sort of individual assets managed locally, even if it's just backups, might be a really valuable uh, way to strengthen your long-term preservation of those assets. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the big benefits of the, the GRS system is it's distributed across many servers. It's not, not super fragile um, to one server farm going down. Um, now the Obviously, if the, <clears throat> the Commons website itself goes down, you can't download it off, the, off that website for a few days, but the data is still available and you can, you can find alternate means in, in an emergency. So I guess it means that it's in Zeb's dark archive as well. <laughs> so. Yeah, and that, I think that server is being backed up by the... <laughs> it is, but you know, uh, it's... <clears throat> The ease with which you can archive the GRS means that you're more likely to find it somewhere, but having a more organized, structured uh, archive would be a real benefit. And I think it'd be another selling point for getting your data in the comments too, right? Um, yes, if you really are legally obligated to archive the data, you better be keeping it yourself too, or be really sure someone else is archiving it uh, in, a, in a systematic way. But oftentimes, um, you know, you don't want to have to do that for everything because most of the things you don't really know if you'll need it. So having an easy way to kind of plug in and just say, yeah, you know, just keep everything annually. That'd be great. That would, I think, really help people. Question. And certainly we do um, want to have the commons be a place that people can discover what's available and it does not mean that we really want have to have every single thing stored within the commons so having a link to an outside site um, is is so much better than not having anything i mean Absolutely. if it lets people get to a place where a, a partner can maintain that data easily themselves they're comfortable with it they like uh, the features that their portal is providing um, then that's fantastic. And we'd almost, um, you know, rather that people are, are comfortable with the option that they're providing and at least the commons lets uh, other users find it. So right. there, there can be a, a balance there. Um, and if you, and the, the, the full art abstract of, of your metadata file is, is searchable. So if you are creative with the way you design your page, you can throw a few keywords in there so that um, if people are off, if you find someone not able to find something that you, that you want to make sure they find in your, in your portal, at least they'll be able to, to find that link. Um, it's not perfect replacement, but there are ways to, to make it a better experience. If that's what you need to do. All right. So who do we contact for suggestions on metadata standards? Well, obviously Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I monitor that generic email from NGO. 
right, everybody, we're a little bit after noon. Thank you so much uh, to all the panelists for sharing your expertise. And thank you to those who um, watched. Uh, of course, uh, the panel was uh, recorded. So once it gets out there, share it widely with anybody who's interested in archiving, preservation, metadata, and things like that. Uh, so thank you again. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye, everybody. All right, thanks, everyone.